Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, so, I'm from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, where's my thing gone? There we are. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about interesting Python projects that you can do on the Raspberry Pi. What the Raspberry Pi gives you extra that you don't generally see on desktop computers and, uh, and other kind of things like that. So uh, who's this guy? Uh, so I'm Ben Nuttall. Uh, I'm on the education team at Raspberry Pi. I, um, I used to work as a software developer and I was hired to join the team to um, because I was doing kind of education stuff and Raspberry Jams and all that kind of stuff in my in my spare time as a as an interest. Um, so we've got uh, there are, uh, we've got some uh, kind of a mix of different kinds of people on the team: education background and developer background. So that's that's where I come from. Um, so first of all, I want to kind of start off with um, a bit of a, um, a little story, a little joke. Uh, so this is um, my friend Alex, uh, who's sitting uh, sitting down here on the second row. He gave a, a great talk yesterday. Uh, he's the author, uh, co-author of this book. Uh, learning Python with Raspberry Pi. He's actually a, a volunteer for the foundation. He's he's at Cambridge University and uh, he's interested in uh, education alongside his kind of academic research. And uh, in in his book, um, he's described as a compiler, hacker, Linux geek, and free so software uh, enthusiast. And he uh, tweeted that about the misplaced comma, uh, which described him as a compiler rather than a compiler hacker. Uh, and I uh, quickly came back with this. Does that make you angry? That would make you a cross compiler. <laughs> Man, I've been waiting for that last for a long time now. That's great. Okay, so uh, this is the Raspberry Pi. You all know, I don't need to, uh, to give you all the usual spiel, single board computer, $35, etc. Uh, we want to get kids, you know, not just, um, you know, not just coding, because everyone keeps talking about coding at the moment. Everyone needs to learn to code for some reason, make some web apps and stuff. Uh, we kind of want to bring in, you know, an actual, actual computing. We, we, you know, we call, we, we call what we do computing, not just coding. Uh, it's about learning how computer systems work uh, and kind of the whole concept of, you know, behind computational thinking and logic. Um, and actually, a lot of the projects we do are not just about code, they're about building some physical thing, using physical computing to, you know, to teach these concepts. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is our education team. So there, there are four of us, uh, three of us are here today. Uh, so there's uh, myself there, this is a picture of me in, um, in America. I did a tour recently um, of, of the States trying to get um, the educational mission across to, um, to the Raspberry Pi users and the community in America. Uh, this is Carrie Ann, uh, Carrie Ann Philbin, the author of Adventures in Raspberry Pi, another great book uh, for inspiring kids to start learning with the Raspberry Pi. And uh, Dave Honest here is, uh, who's here as well, uh, who's uh, again like, like myself used to be a developer and now he's, he's on the team with us. We've also got a guy called Clive Beale, who's the kind of the director of our educational mission. Um, he's not here today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to PyCon because he he had to go all the way to New York to uh, make a fair. So unfortunately, you know, I'm sure he'd much rather be here, but New York called. Okay, so. As well as the Raspberry Pi kind of being a desktop computer, so you, you boot it up, you get a desktop, there are icons, it's just like being in front of a laptop or a, or a PC. As well as you know being able to open up Idle and type some Python code in or something like that, you've got these GPIO pins. So this is the 26 pins on the, on the original Raspberry Pi, the Model B. Uh, and you can just wire up kind of electronic components and things like that and actually talk to those from something like Python or, or basically anything you want. Um, so that kind of opens up a new world that you wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't get if you're just making a web app or making you know, a little game or something like that. You can actually do something physical. And there are 40 pins on the, uh, the Model B Plus that we released um, a couple of months ago. So we kind of extended that. Uh, we, we were able to add some new components and extend the Pi a bit more and keep it at the same price because, you know, Moore's Law. So, uh, so yeah, we've got, so you've got 40 GPIO pins available there that you can, it's a ridiculous example of a whole bunch of LEDs. Um, and not just actual phys physically wiring things with, you know, with bits of wire, but um, you can also make, uh, you can also get add-on boards that uh, allow you to just stick something on top of the Pi. And that level of abstraction, you know, somebody might have made a robotics add-on board that has all the bits that you need to make yourself a little, little rover, a little, little robot, something like that. So it's really cool um, projects that come out of the ability to plug your Raspberry Pi into the real world and interface, for, uh, interface your thing with some code, you know, with some Python code, something like that. So um, you've all heard about uh, Fuzzy Duck Brewery. I want to make sure I say that right. Fuzzy Duck Brewery. Um, 
here this weekend, one of the sponsors, and you've probably drank some of their beer last night. Uh, they actually, I actually found this out this morning, that the Python GPIO library was born out of them trying to control the brewery, for, you know, the, the beer, pro, beer brewery process for their beer. And he actually started working on the library just as a composite part of his project. And it became the canonical kind of way of interfacing the GPIO from Python. It's what everybody uses. It's, a, it's, it's bread and butter in Raspbian, really. So uh, this is available when you install the Raspberry Pi and you get uh, install Raspberry being on the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just a simple library, really nice simple interface. So you just set up a pin. So I'm saying, you know, pin 17 here. Uh, wait for a, a pin press, or, you know, wait for a, a high input on pin 17 and then do something. So wait for that and then print, you know, whatever as a basic example. So that's your hello world in GPIO. Uh, you can have a, you know, wire up another one that has, you know, a, a light flashing. So when I press this button, turn this light on as another simple example. Uh, we also have a camera module for the Raspberry Pi, so it's uh, again a very cheap, very affordable uh, add-on for the Pi that we make. That's uh, just a little ribbon cable with a kind of a mobile phone um, camera on there, but it's a really good quality camera. You can get 1080p full HD photo and video out of that, but not just you know sort of take video and take pictures. There's um, you know ways you can incorporate that into your code. So there's a fantastic um, Python library for the camera. So my friend Dave Jones from Manchester actually, again, just started doing this. His wife's a paleontologist, and she does a lot of microscope, you know, micro, uh, microscopy pictures, and you know, she looks at fossils and things like that. And he just started helping her use the Raspberry Pi, um, you know, to take pictures on the, you know, stick stick the camera on the end of the microscope, and then process the images and log them. And he built a little web app for her to kind of um, catalog images when they're taken. And it just made her process of using, instead of using the university system, um, it just made that process much easier and much, um, you know, much better. So he started working on that and the little web app and everything. And he, you know, again, before he knew it, he kind of had the basis of a library. And now this is what people use, you know, around the world to do their Python projects with the interface with the camera. It's a fantastic library, um, an amazing set of documentation on Read the Docs. Uh, he's a really good project maintainer, so. Uh, it's well worth checking out if you ever want to have a play with the Pi camera. Uh, so this is a basic example. So import Pi camera in, from time, import sleep, and just with you know with that camera, start the preview. So you get the picture on the screen. Sleep for five seconds. Take a picture. Stop preview. You know, simple as that. Just to just to uh, add. You know, if you add that add that little bit in, of. Um, Add that little bit into your code, and you've got something that, you know, something that triggers that that takes that takes a picture. Um, so here's um, a, a mix of the GPIO and the Pi camera. So, you know, again, set up that pin 17 we used earlier. Uh, wait for a button press on 17, and then take a picture. This is actually what we did with the kids in the on the education track yesterday. They wired up a physical button on a breadboard that triggered the camera to take a picture. We use that in a in a while true loop to take pictures continuously whenever they press the, the button, and they would uh, they set up Lego characters uh, on a little scene, and we stitched all the photos together to make a stop motion animation. Really simple, really interesting, and engaging way of you know introducing these you know this these programming concepts uh, into you know into the lives of children into the what they can do in school, and then you know you can do things like. Okay, so what happens if I put the sleep uh, after, you know, if, what if I put a sleep in after, after they press the button? What, you know, what, why would you need that? What, would, what situation would you want that? What situation would you not want to sleep? If you wanted to have, a, you know, a loop that took 10 pictures, but it had a sleep in it, you know, what, 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 would, what would that be used for? Uh, and if you remove the sleep, what, you know, what sort of application might want to take 10 pictures straight away? Or, would, you know, or wait for a button press? And that, that kind of thing. So um, this is a really good example of um, a project somebody did with um, <laughs> a project somebody did where they used Pi Camera, the Python Pi Camera library. Um, so he was fed up of garden uh, if cats. 
sorry. He was fed up with uh, cats coming into his garden, so he set up a Raspberry Pi with a camera, um, and he, he watches out for it. And he, he, he no, he just looked, he just picked up the documentation for the library and found that all these features that you know the, the sort of things you might use in your project already existed. So all the the library code allowed him to just detect something in the picture and then you know use that you know use that coordinate to use the the position in the in the picture to fire the um, the water hose at it. <laughs> And then, of course, it uploads the video to YouTube when it knows that's happened. So, <laughs> so this was on the register, and they, they put in the, the, a YouTube video of, of this cat leaping for uh, you know for its life uh, when it got sprayed with water. But again, just you know the the amazing library just being available for um, for them to just pick up and start their project with. They didn't need to start it from scratch. You didn't need to you know work out how the image detection worked or anything like that. The positioning it's already just there. So he's just built on that. So robotics is a really popular kind of area in, in Raspberry Pi in education and in schools. Um, a lot of people kind of want you know want to be able to build their own robot. I mean I'm not talking about the sorts of robots that you might have seen uh, over there um, yesterday, the big kind of humanoid ones. Um, just you know just kind of rovers and little, little just a Raspberry Pi on wheels basically. A lot of what you know a lot of these kinds of things are. So you've got this one here that's just a little add-on board that kind of um, you know controls the motors and a little battery pack and it's just a little you know laser cut chassis on, on wheels. Uh, this one's kind of similar, it's just using um, a big track kind of style um, driving force there. So really simple to put these together. Lots of people are doing it around the world and sharing, you know, sharing their ideas, sharing how it works. Um, and just you know, it, uh, I kind of uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and just thought, you know, imagine the first time you ever wrote a for loop was actually getting a robot to turn around, or the you know the first time you you know you introduced uh, you know some new concept, it was actually doing something so much more interesting than printing to the screen. You know, that's what kind of Raspberry Pi really kind of brings out in this. It's it's learning Python and learning really good tools that you could use in any situation, in any industry, but you know, much more engaging and much more. There's much more reason to want to do this uh, if you're a child. So there's plenty of robots here. This is a kind of a monster one that um, so some people made that's it's like a got a car battery in there I think. Kind of crazy. And there's a few on kind of popping up on Kickstarter this kind of style. Really nice. Um, really nice looking and easy to assemble and just, just in kit form you just need to put them together. Laser cut that kind of thing. And some of them are just you know almost a Raspberry Pi on wheels. Uh, so this is a really cool uh, resource we put together. So we have a, a, a section of resources on our website. Ever since we started this education team um, and started doing the sorts of things that we never, they, the foundation never thought they would be doing themselves, the idea was just for us to put the Raspberry Pi in the hands of kids and make it available and leave the community to it. But then um, we've got so much um, kind of, um, we've got you know a certain amount of money coming in from the sales of Raspberry Pis that we can we can put that money back into our educational mission. So. We start hiring. They start hiring people to, to do that. And we actually write resources that are free on our website um, for people to use to teach um, and to learn with Raspberry Pi. So this is one. Uh, my colleague Dave down here at the here at the front got hold of a, uh, a little Morse code tapper. Uh, you just uh, wire them up into the GPIO, and you just listen on those pins. And then he's built a whole resource where you you build up the whole. Um, the whole project in Python, and you're learning uh, along the way how to interpret that and how to turn it into uh, into text. Uh, and again, really interesting ways of learning Python concepts. So you know, just you know, that might be the first time you saw a dictionary, and it's kind of an interesting way of showing how um, you know teaching some new concept. Um, you might have heard uh, as well. We also have a free version of Minecraft on Raspberry Pi. Uh, that's available and it's installed by default now. So, again, not just uh, can you go around and uh, play Minecraft and actually go, you know, go around and build things manually. There's a Python interface to this. So there's an API provider that allows you to 
in, you know, interact with the world around you, kind of manipulate the world around you uh, with with some Python code. So again, if you know, uh, you know, using loops and things like that to actually, you know, it's not just a labour-saving device for keen Minecrafters, but it's you know an interesting way of showing, you know, teaching those concepts. So you can kind of um, you can set blocks, you know, uh, around you according to you know learning the coordinate system, and um, and in, you know interface things, change things the way you want them, um, and have little games that kind of where things things follow you know blocks actually are placed as as you walk around. So um, Martin, one of the one of the Minecraft. Um, Workshop leaders yesterday. He had one where he built a whole house, and then the house followed him as he, and he as he walks around. The house, the whole house, is walking around. Um, so this is a, a really cool kind of um, kind of project that um, a, a company made. So it's a this is a company that generally makes the remote switches for um, for power sockets, so you can turn off the Christmas tree lights without getting you, if you can't get around the back, that kind of thing. They started. Um, they, they actually made a, an ad, a little add-on for the Raspberry Pi. So you stick it on the, the GPIO pins, and you can, from some from some Python code, you can turn you know the, turn the thing off. So this is one of the things they sell, which is just a single unit. So you can send a message to that to turn it on or turn it off. And they do like a four a four way you know sort of four gang one, so you can turn them off by number. Um, they provide some Python code that's um, it's on their website that just t tells you the whole binary string that you need to send to, to you know to, to send each sort of um, um, uh, each combination of one two three four uh, on or off. And we actually gave that it was a really messy set of code and a load of examples. And we gave that to um, a girl who was with us on work experience. She's uh, uh, 14, 15 years old, and we kind of asked her to look at the binary strings and kind of work out what the logic was of how, how this thing worked, and to to sort of modularize that and actually put it together in, um, in a nice little module. So, because it turns out, you know, 13, 14 year old girls are better at Python than the people who sell this thing. So, uh, so she did that, and we got this amazing, um, you know, really simple interface from Energini import switch on and switch off. What more do you need? Um, switch on number one, switch off number one, switch on four, sleep for ten seconds, switch off number four. So imagine just plugging this into your code. You could have, you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I talked about the GPIO and kind of wiring up, um, you know, wiring up LEDs and lights and, and things like that. But um, sometimes, you know, if you, if, it's, if you want if you want a project where somebody walks in the room and it turns the TV on, you don't necessarily want to be wiring up your TV and kind of hacking the back of it. You just want to turn it off at the wall. So a really simple way to solve that, you know, that kind of problem. Uh, last last little project. I'm, I'm um, getting waves that now. So uh, yeah, that's the last project I want to tell you about, which is really cool. Sous vide cooking. So this is the um, concept of uh, the practice where you. Vacuum pack your food. So this is some steak here, um, vacuum packed, and then you cook it in in a water bath in a, um, in a something like a slow cooker. So you just um, sous vide is all about maintaining the, a particular temperature. So you work out what the the exact temperature that the uh, that for instance steak cooks best at according to its weight and, and type of the type of um, type of meat. And you you know you find out what temperature uh, you should leave it at, and then you just maintain that particular temperature. So with a, just with a Raspberry Pi um, and some Python code, you can just watch out for you know that temperature rising, and when it gets to a particular threshold, you use the Energini from before to turn turn it off, and then when it gets a bit too low, it reaches the next, the previous threshold, turn it back on, and just maintain that temperature of you know. 80 degrees or you know 60 degrees, whatever it is, and you cook that over a particular period, you know, a few hours, but like slow cooking, but it's more, much more controlled, and you you, you end up with you know really well cooked, really perfectly cooked food. And I tried the steak from uh, that we did with this when we were testing it, and it was fantastic. <laughs> I, I highly recommend it. So re again, really simple, really simple abstraction to kind of quite quite a complex. Um, you know, area of kind of research for a lot of people that are cooking food per to perfection. Uh, really simple interface and um, really cool project. Very tasty. So uh, I've got some cards at the front, but uh, if you just want to grab a picture of that, that's, uh, that'll do as well. Uh, if you want to come and talk to me about education or, uh, or the Raspberry Pi or, or uh, any questions as well, that'd be that'd be great. I'll take questions now as well.
Hello, is this thing on? Yeah. Um, an, an observation, and just to mention another project that, that you didn't, the, um, the Pi phone, which is now still very much a sort of a, a proof of concept and an amusing little hack but one of the I think that you know one of the things the world really rather needs is a properly open smartphone in terms of both hardware and software so with that in mind how long is it going to be before the Raspberry Pi compute module becomes um, available in uh, low numbers at still at low cost because uh, you can I believe you can sort of buy batches of you know, a few, you know, a few of the things are like a few, a couple of hundred quid. Um, uh, so at the at the moment, um, is, this, is, this one is this one on? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, we um, we're all, I think we're only selling the um, the development kit for the compute module, so you can buy. Oh, sorry. For, if anyone doesn't know, we we recently um, brought out a an industrial compute module for the Raspberry Pi. So it's um, you get uh, the development kit comes with a, an I/O board uh, and a um, the compute module, which is a basically a Raspberry Pi chip on a sodium chip, a, a, like a RAM chip that you slot into the, the dev board and um, and you, you know the idea is that it, you can use that in um, an industrial project, an industrial product. So if you want to make a smart TV or something, you like the idea of the infrastructure of Raspberry Pi. Uh, instead of you know cramming in a Model B in there and having to forward all the ports to the right place, you just use the module, uh, which is a much more flexible form factor. Allows you to put everything, you know, design your your own I/O board because it's completely open open hardware. Um, design your own I/O board and put everything in the right place and everything the way that you want it. Because a lot of people have been using Raspberry Pis um, in products in in industry, and we, although you know that's not um, that's not why we started. We're not trying to make you know a, a cheap a cheap quick win for for industry. Uh, it, we're about education, but the way we see it is that we we would like to help those people because anything that they do that uses Raspberry Pi, you know the libraries they contribute back, the you know the money that it brings in will only help our educational mission. Um, but to to answer your question, so. Uh, you can currently only buy the development kit, which is the I/O board that we, you, you know you would use as your prototype and the one compute module. We'll soon to be um, releasing the the compute module itself. If you want to buy those um, to use, you know, if you want to buy a lot of those, I'm not certain actually what the um, what what the quota will be for that. Whether you'll be able to buy them singularly or in the hundreds, or I'm not I'm not really sure to be honest. But it, it sh they should be available soon, I believe. Smartphone privacy, so kids really like their their phones. And if you, um, you know, if you could have kids making their and programming their own smartphone, yeah. and not giving away their data to Google or yeah. Apple or whoever, that would be a, a giggle. Yeah, that's really cool. The um, I did specifically didn't mention the the, the Python because it's it wasn't particularly a Python project, but um, yeah, really cool um, use of the Raspberry Pi there. There was the Pi Pad, which came first, which was a a, a screen in a, in a kind of tablet style with a Pi inside it, um, and then the Pi Phone came later, which was a a, a, a little touch screen LCD um, that you could actually had a GSM module and that kind of thing on it that you could actually dial and use it use it as a phone. So I really cool that kind of project like that. It was kind of bulky in his hand, but it wasn't ridiculous, was it? It was it was pretty cool. I've uh, got time for one more question. Yeah. Okay, so we have I keep asking you this question and you're probably going to say the same answer as you gave me at Europython, but it's good for everybody else to hear it. Um, so what's coming after the B plus? <laughs> Um, okay, so our our price point is thirty five dollars. We're not particularly planning on changing that. Uh, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, we just want you know, we want ARMv7, or we want this, or we want SATA, or we want a real time clock." Uh, we, we just kind of put everything that we can that we think is is useful for our, for our mission on on the thirty five dollar um, Raspberry Pi, and uh, we've kind of gone a whole step above for the for the industry and kind of given them the whole platform they can build, you know, the, whatever they want, um, very cheap for. Um, you know, if they want SATA on there, they can build a board with SATA. If they want a real-time clock, they can do that. Uh, our focus is the $35 one for education. Um, we'll we'll get in there. So we had the Model B, the original Model B, which came out, which had 256 meg of RAM. Then, within a few months, we were able to squeeze in another, uh, you know, a, a 512 meg, meg, meg of RAM um, for the same price. And then. 
a, a year or so later, we you know recently we brought out the the, the B plus, which had four USB ports. We added we added a couple and 40 GPIO pins and sorted out the power and kind of organized that. Uh, we intend to to continue development. We're not just going to stop and say that's you know that's good enough and um, you know you should think yourselves lucky. We we intend to to keep working on it, but um, we've only just brought out the B plus. There's uh, I can't say that there's anything Im you know I wouldn't expect anything imminently, but we'd like to keep developing. Just keep buying pies so we get more money. Are we, are we wrapping up? Uh, okay, one more. Hi Ben, thank you. Um, we've got our own little development team at Edge Hill that we do quite a lot of work and we've, we're dying to give it to you. But one of the things that we would all like as teachers, those of us that are Pi enthusiasts, is the Wi-Fi wi facility on the Pi. Is that coming? No. No. Okay. <laughs> that was short and sweet. Short and sweet. But you've got uh, four USB ports now, so you can plug your mouse, keyboard, and a Wi-Fi dongle in. Still have one left. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's certain things people say like, oh, why can't you just add SATA? Why can't you just add a real time? It would only cost another five pounds. It's like, yeah, but every kid around the world who wants to use it to program Python or play Minecraft, uh, you know, they have to pay an extra five pounds just because you want a real time clock. Um, you know, you can buy your own real time clock for about a fiver that you can you can add on. So, yeah, it's the generally with the way we see things. We've, we've made certain decisions and, and made certain sacrifices and things like that, and it's a, it's a balance. You know, some people don't want as many GPIO pins as we give. Some people People want more. It's you know you, you, we've got to have a balance. All right. Okay. Thank you.